In this video, you will learn five Godot programming patterns. The subclass sandbox, which you can use to make AI, for example. Command, which allows you to turn functions into objects you can pass around. Conditional feature exports, which lets you make game builds with or without debug features. Fluent interface, a technique to chain function calls on a single line. State machine, a tool to split an entity's complex behaviors into separate objects. This is a collab with Doro and Mario from Play with Percifer. You can learn five more essential patterns on their channel. You'll find a link to the other video in the description, so be sure to watch it after this. This video is sponsored by our Godot courses. I'll tell you more about that at the end, but for now, let's learn some programming patterns. Let's take a game where you have different kinds of enemies. You want each of them to have some health, to have some similar behaviors, like being able to pursue the player or detect them uh, within a certain range, as you can see on the screen. In this case, the subclass sandbox pattern can be useful. It's inheritance with a slight twist. So here's an example with the shield enemy that can orbit around the player that you saw which inherits from a base scene and script called mob. If I open the mob script, you can see that I have a bunch of functions defined, and the idea of this pattern is to put all the shared behaviors, all the reusable functions in the base class, like follow some target, orbit around your target, uh, take some damage, die, um, shoot a bullet, or something like this in the base class, and then in the inherited class, in this case the shield, you have only this amount of code uh, to implement the enemy. You implement the enemy based on the functions that you created in the base class. If you look at the physics process function, it's mostly blue because most of what I'm doing is calling functions. This pattern works great for things like enemies, especially in an indie game where the scope is not too large, or for things like weapons. You can see I just uh, got to different spell, and we use the same pattern here for the shotgun spell. It makes it very easy to create new enemies and change them. The drawback of that is the same you have every time you use inheritance. It's that uh, you're going to have a lot of code on the base script, and in the base scene, you're going to need a bunch of components as well to make everything work together. So you can end up with slightly bloated uh, mobs or spells or weapons. It's a balancing act you have to make. Have you ever had a function signature that looked like this? We surely had. It starts so innocently with just a few parameters. And then you add another one and another one. And suddenly you are here and it is not that pretty anymore. Default values help, but when you add a new parameter, it needs a default value or else you have to update all calls to the function. And it's even worse when you pass all those arguments through another function. For those complex signatures, a better way is to make a data class for that. For our take damage method, we introduced a damage source class. And it was so, so helpful. You can very easily add an argument now just by adding to the class. No signature changes. You are also much more flexible in how you create instances of this class. We could use specific initialization methods for different use cases, instead of fiddling around with the same parameters in different situations. It has gotten so much more readable because of this. In Godot 4, you can simply add static constructors within the script itself. In Godot 3, you will need a separate class for this. You might think constructing objects is a waste of performance. But most of the time it really does not matter, and in many cases it even is faster. If you pass 20 arguments around, sometimes two or three levels, they are copied every time. Int and floats etc. are passed by value. Passing one object is cheap because you just pass one address. And you can often reuse the arguments object and just modify a damage value or something. That is very cheap actually. This has a few other implications that you should be aware of. Different to primitive types, when you change the parameters now, they will remain different. This is called a side effect. And why functional programmers really, really dislike that, it can be kinda handy, honestly. You can use this as a convenient way of passing information back. But please document side effects of functions when you do that. Otherwise, you will just forget about that and have unexpected changes to an object. Alternatively, you can program without any side effects. Either copy the object before passing 
or never change any of their properties. You often need to code things differently depending on the platform, such as the ability to toggle full screen in this example, in this app. We have a button integrated into the app in the desktop version that you can see here. And if I go to the browser version, then it's a bit different. We have a uh, button that's part of the web page and that toggles the full screen state of the app on the browser's side. To achieve this, we use the function os.hasFeature. You can use this to check if a given feature is available in your build of the game. For example, we can check for JavaScript and if the JavaScript interface is available, it means that we are running in a web browser. You can check which features are available by default by going to Project, Export. There, um, you can select one of the presets on the left and then click on the Features tab. You will see, for example, X11 stands for Linux and PC means that the game is running on the desktop. So you can use these to have code specific to Linux builds of your game and specific to desktop builds of the game. You can also add custom feature tags to your export. And so, for example, say that you want to make a demo for Kickstarter and you want to limit the power or, or mechanics the player has available. So you could say, uh, you know, Kickstarter demo at this as a feature. And then in your code, you could write if OS dot has feature Kickstarter underscore demo and run code only in this specific case. Now we will get fancy. There is a really neat way of structuring your code that sometimes can be far easier readable than the alternative. It's called the Fluent Interface. And you may have seen that used within Godot's interfaces, like the one of the string class. Another example are the tweens in Godot 4, or the new scene tree tweens in Godot 3. The signatures are super short and every method has a very concise purpose. You don't pass the tweens delay as the seventh parameter, you call set delay and give it just the delay. And it is pretty easy to do this yourself. When you have a function that would usually return nothing, simply return self instead. This returns the object itself. Let's do this with a bunch of setters. We can even leave out the set because it kinda reads well. We can now write this instead of this. It's especially useful when the object can be parameterized in manifold ways. It is more flexible than optional arguments and it's explicitly named, which makes it quite readable. You can even do this with more complex types of manipulation than just setting, like transforming a list. You could, for example, add a filter function that checks each element with a function you pass. In Godot 4, you can simply pass the function like this and in Godot 3, we need to wrap it in a functref. Now it filters all elements that are odd and now all that are less than 10. And by the way, you can use it in onReadyVars and use it as an expression when passing an argument without needing an extra variable. Finite state machines are one of the most popular programming patterns for video games. They consist of splitting behavior across multiple standalone objects. In the example of this character here, we have one state for when the character is idle, one for when it's running on the ground, and one when it's in the air, whether it's jumping or falling. This allows us to keep the code of each state relatively short, but it also helps to reuse code if we want to and to separate concern because now we have uh, one script for the air movement, which can make debugging the air movement a little easier. The implementation can be pretty simple or pretty complex. Uh, I lean on the simplest side with this one. So we have a state machine script that stores the current state the character is in, right? Uh, and it takes care of delegating calls from the engine to this state object. So unhandled input, process, physics process, whatever you need. This makes it so only the current state that we store in this state variable will be processing and updating the character, allowing us to have only one behavior running at a time, idle, run, or error in this case. Then it has a function to transition to a different state. And the way uh, we've chosen to do it is using nodes 
idle run error and to use the node paths to transition. So precisely in this case, we store some code in the move node here. And when transitioning to state, we will pass a uh, pass like move slash run to switch to the run state and move slash air to switch to the air state. Then we have a state script that stores a reference to the state machine node. So uh, this node up there to call the transition to function on the state machine. It also defines some functions that you can override in child scripts to handle input, to uh, receive calls to process and physics process. By default, they will not do anything. And we also have enter and exit functions to respectively initialize and deinitialize the state or clean up uh, when transitioning to different states in the state machine. We have a long guide on our website you can check out. Uh, it contains code examples and more explanations. You'll find a link in the description below. That's five programming patterns you should try in your Godot projects. On Play With First First channel, you can learn five more right now. You'll find a link to the video in the description. This video is sponsored by our courses. Learn to Code from Zero is for anyone who wants to understand how to code games. It's the only course with interactive practices you can do right in Godot. Then there's Godot Node Essentials. It's the largest cookbook to learn very concrete ways to use Godot's nodes in your projects. It covers all the essentials for 2D, UI, and 3D nodes.